Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the May meeting of the Randolph County Board of Commissioners. We have a good turnout tonight, and uh, we welcome each one of you here for this process. Um, I do want to make a note, and for those of you that, that are watching, we are live streaming as we have been uh, recently uh, at home, Facebook, YouTube. But to those of you in the, in the audience tonight also, um, if you want the technical version, I'll have to get somebody else. But basically, the switch is broke, so there won't be anything showing on our screens tonight. Uh, and if the presenters have information there, we won't be able to see them on our screens up here. The folks at home can't see, and you in the audience will not see any uh, activity. We just found that out since we got here tonight. So uh, we do make that notation for all that, that are watching, or those of you, again, that are in the audience. So uh, I will make note that Commissioner Kidd will be joining us a little bit later. He was had a business assignment this afternoon and driving in from Robinson County. So uh, he'll be joining us at, at some point during our meeting this evening. So welcome. We're glad to have you tonight. Have a lot of business to conduct. Uh, at this time, I would like to call on uh, Chaplain and Bishop Michael Trogdon for our invocation tonight. And uh, we'll have our Pledge of Allegiance. So please remove your caps and rise, please. could bow your heads with me. <clears throat> so Father, in the name of Jesus, we are so grateful, God, for another day to transact business that honors you, that glorifies your great name. God, we thank you for this gathering tonight, God, of concerned citizens of our community. God, we thank you, Lord, for our county commissioners. Thank you, God, for them accepting the call, Lord God, to, to make decisions for the, the welfare of the whole of Randolph County. God, we pray tonight in the mighty name of Jesus for the wisdom of God. We pray, God, for the conviction of your spirit, Lord God, that we do everything that honors you, that glorifies you. So God, we do. We pray, Lord God, that you would just rest in this meeting with us tonight. Lord, I pray for decisions that will uh, affect everyone equally, Lord God, that there will be fairness and integrity and honor. Lord God, that you might be glorified and the whole of our community will be edified and strengthened. We honor you for this time, and we anticipate your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Michael. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Please be seated. Uh, before we uh, go into our special recognitions and our public comment period, I, I do want to make a note to, uh, to the board and to again to the citizens. Uh, we are pulling agenda item D, which is the item dealing with our opioid settlement funding uh, allocations. Um, we had some news that came to, to the county just Friday, and uh, we but I became aware of it later, earlier today. There is a program planned here in the county on May the 22nd at two o'clock in the afternoon. That's on a Monday. It's an opi opioid collaboration program, special program that's being conducted by a, a lady from the Council of Churches. And we will be inviting uh, members from our faith community to attend that meeting that day. Uh, as, we, uh, as we learn more about this process and what it does, and, what it, and, and I think equally important, what it doesn't do. But our, uh, our goal here is to save lives. And uh, that's what this funding is supposed to accomplish. And so it has to be used in the proper way. Um, the rules, the restrictions placed on the use of that money is, is very limited, very defined, and we have very little leeway in how it's used. So um, we have to take that into consideration as, as we go through the process. But that will be a part of the process of learning 
and educating all of us uh, through that process. And that will be, and the, the location will be announced a little bit later. We're talking about maybe possibly even AVS somewhere where, where we could accommodate a larger crowd. So just make you aware of that. So item D will not, will not be on our agenda tonight. And uh, it will be again in the future, uh, probably at June after we have that, that meeting, depending on what and if something else comes out of that process. So thank you for that tonight. Next is our special recognition. Lieutenant Scotty Hicks is retiring from the Randolph County Sheriff's Department. I'll recognize Chief Deputy Andre Hazelton and uh, for the presentation and who's just yes, come right ahead. So Major Kevin Walton is asking to present on behalf of Lieutenant Hicks. Very good. Good afternoon. I hope everybody's okay. Uh, <clears throat> Lieutenant Scotty Hicks began his career in law enforcement at the Davidson County Sheriff's Office in July of 1994, following his graduation of basic law enforcement training in February of 1994. He was hired by the Randolph County Sheriff's Office on December 16, 1995, assigned to the patrol division. In 1996, he became K-9 handler to K-9 Buck and was assigned to the Community Crimes Task Force. <coughs> on July 16, 2000, he was promoted to the rank of Senior Patrol of Community Crimes Task Force. Lieutenant Hicks received his basic law enforcement certificate from the North Carolina Sheriff's Education and Training and Standards Commissions in 2000. In April of 2004, the criminal interdiction team was created and Hicks was assigned to this team and became a K-9 handler to K-9 Inks. Lieutenant Hicks earned his intermediate and advanced law enforcement certificates in August of 2006. February 1st, 2007, when he was promoted to corporal of the criminal interdiction team, he was promoted to sergeant over that team in June of 2009. On August 1st, 2010, Lieutenant Hicks was transferred back to patrol as a sergeant. In June of 2016, he was promoted to lieutenant and has served in that capacity until his retirement on May 1st, 2023. During Lieutenant Hicks' tenure with the office, he volunteered as a uh, as a sniper on the emergency response team for many years. In his retirement, Scotty plans to spend more time with his wife, Lori, son, Hayden, and daughter, Morgan. He also planned, plans to spend more time with his knees in the breeze on his Harley. So however, he intends to remain active reserve deputy with the sheriff's office. Uh, so his many years of training experience will continue to benefit the county. Scott will be Scotty will be greatly missed in his law enforcement family, but rest assured that he will remain active part of the Sheriff's Reserve Division. Uh, Lieutenant Scotty Hicks is recognized for 27 and a half years of faithful service to the citizens of Randolph County and 29 years total in law enforcement. And on behalf of the Sheriff's Office and myself, uh, we, we will miss Scotty and we do appreciate him and his service. Lieutenant Hicks and his wife, Lori, if y'all join us up here, please. We have already recognized Lieutenant Hicks this morning. The sheriff was there. Um, however, Lori was not there, and we have a plaque to present to her as well. Um, in the law enforcement community, the sacrifices that law enforcement makes is not theirs alone. Those sacrifices are also made by their families. So we'd like to recognize Lori and this is a plaque from Sheriff Seabolt. May it be known that this certificate is presented to Lori Hicks in recognition of your generous and dedicated support of Scotty Hicks and your countless sacrifices which have helped further the goals and objectives of the Randolph County Sheriff's Office.
Scotty, I know 27 and a half years you've seen a lot of this county, and uh, we owe you a, de a deep a dead gratitude for all your service watching over us. I say lots of times I sleep good at night. I know this county's in good hands because of officers like you that are out there every day and night putting your life on the line, and we thank you for that sincerely. Appreciate all your service, and I hope you have many miles on that motorcycle. <laughs> This is in grateful appreciation to Lieutenant Scotty Hicks in recognition of 27 and a half years of service, May the 1st, 2023, presented by the Randolph County Board of Commissioners. God bless you, Scott. Best to you. I also want to mention at this time, um, just in the last uh, week or 10 days here in the county, uh, we have lost a couple of our employees um, who passed away and at very young ages. And I want to recognize uh, Jeff Baker. He passed away on April the 21st at the age of 62 years old. He was employed with the Randolph County Maintenance Department for the past seven years and he previously had worked in maintenance at Kaiser Roth for 39 years. Uh, he enjoyed hunting and trout fishing, and we re remember and uh, offer prayers and support for Jeff's family. Teresa Mitchell from the Department of Social Services. Ms. Mitchell passed away on April the 23rd at the age of 59. She has served the state of North Carolina as an income maintenance worker for the past 25 years plus at the Randolph County Department of Social Services. She loved arts and crafts and enjoyed working weekends at the local arts guild. And we wish our best in our prayers and support for Teresa's family. So just wanted to make that notation tonight uh, as we, uh, we need all of our employees and we mourn those that, that pass. And for the families, we, our prayers again go out to them. So thank you. This is now time for our public comment period. I'll ask our attorney to uh, tell us the rules. Mr. Chairman, the rules of procedure for the public comment period are as follows. The public comment period would be limited to 15 minutes at the beginning of the meeting. If more time is required, it will be at the discretion of the board. Each speaker must give his or her name, both orally and in writing before speaking. Speakers will be limited to three minutes. Comments are to be directed to the board as a whole and not to one individual commissioner response, discussion, or action concerning issues raised during the public input session will be at the discretion of the board. Speakers will be courteous in their language and presentation, and speakers should not discuss matters which concern the candidacy of any person seeking public office or matters in current or anticipated litigation. Thank you. Madam Clerk? Joe Milliken. My name is Joe Milliken. I live on 1788 Naomi Road in Randleman, North Carolina. I was reading some stuff this week and doing some research that was interesting. I thought I'd pass on to uh, mostly the members of Randolph County. Uh, I feel that all of our people here on the board, they, they know of all this. They study it all the time. It's cons of rural growth. These days, growth bypasses rural economics. This is per Mr. Gilston, a rural economist. Rural econ economist. The most helpful policy for people in small towns could be relaxed zoning rules so that more affordable homes could be built in rural areas. What is essential smart growth fixes for rural planning? Essential smart growth fixes for rural planning, zoning, and development provides policy options that can help rural communities strengthen their economics while preserving rural character. Thankfully, the county saw the rule would kill the county. 
now every meeting, this is all, there is always people to come to complain about the mega site. The county has done its part on getting good paying jobs for the people. It is running a little behind on getting places for the new workers to live. Hopefully that's being changed. And I was just going to point out here, growth management plan. The goal of the growth management plan is not to stop growth, but to channel the more intense growth to areas where public infrastructure allows growth to be sustained over the long term. The plan also provides development opportunities for those properties located in environmentally sensitive areas of Randolph County. Thank you, guys. Good points. Thank you, Joe. Clyde Faust. Good afternoon. My name is Clyde Faust and I'm honored to stand before you today. I'm here today to talk about what we've been talking about for quite some time. I want to reiterate to this board that it is an injustice for us to have a Confederate monument in front of the building where this board meets. That is not an opinion, that is a fact. The reason that it is a fact is because we know that the Confederacy, from the writings of the state of South Carolina, Georgia, Louisiana, Mississippi, Texas, Florida, I think Alabama, if I didn't already mention them, they all put in writing why they wanted to leave the United States. Every one of them said they wanted to leave the United States to preserve and expand slavery. The state of Georgia said the main reason or the principal reason they were leaving the United States was the preservation of slavery. State of Mississippi called slavery the greatest material interest in the world. On top of that, we know that citizens from Randolph County were executed by Confederates. On top of that, we know that citizens from Randolph County were sold away from their families right here in Randolph County because of a practice or a way of life that the Confederacy killed Americans to keep. I am honored tonight to be able to say that we have started a petition drive and in just two days, we have over 150 names of Randolph County citizens who agree that the monument must be moved, not destroyed, but moved. It has no place being in front of where this body meets. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chief. Wayne Roberts. Good evening, Dwayne Roberts. I'm retired from Energizer Battery Company after 42 years and uh, four months. And it's just great to see that Energizer is doing well with their expansions and, uh, and just their contributions to the community, not only to Randolph County, but to Asheboro and Randolph County. And uh, the last morning that I was there saying my goodbyes, things really didn't look good. So I'm really pleased to see that uh, they're gonna be doing well and hiring new employees and uh, they might even let me go back if, the, if I wanted to, you know. But uh, Jefferson Davis rode a white horse. Abraham Lincoln rode a mule. Jefferson Davis was a gentleman. Abraham Lincoln was a fool. Thank you so much. Lydia Davenport. Good evening. This is, I'm Lydia Davenport. I live at 1477 Walker Road, Asheboro, and it's out 49. And I really like it out there, it's quiet. I used to live at the corner of Buffalo Ford and Grantville Lane and for 30 years saw some really bad wrecks there, but. I'm here about the Confederate statue also. I've done my ancestry and my, my, the Logan side is my, my father's side and I've done my husband's side. And as far back as that I can reliably say into the 1500s, 
there's not a mention of any of my ancestors or my husband's ancestors who ever had chains, were sold as slaves. I can almost guarantee there's not a white person in here that can say that they had ancestors that were in chains or sold as slaves. The Confederate statue out front, the motto is, our Confederate heroes. The Civil War and the slavery, I'm sorry, slavery was over 240 years. That's, if we're 80 years old, that's three lifetimes. I find it so hard to understand why our white community can't understand why the statue's offensive. I love statues. I think it's a beautiful statue, but I agree, it, I don't believe it needs to be in front of the courthouse. Put a statue out there that honors um, somebody from the Quaker church that helped st slavery or st helped to stop slavery. But I just think it's a shame. And I, I want to make a statement also about our pledge. It says, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. It should say, equal liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Thank you. Tim Saunders. Good afternoon. You know, I came here with a particular speech. But after watching the news and seeing what's been going on here lately, I'm going to change that speech. It has come to soul searching time. There are such things as moral, morally correct things. And there are things which are not morally correct. Lying, cheating, and stealing are not morally correct. And when you have a bad situation, and here I'm talking about the obsession of some people for guns, that's a mental illness. I hear people talk about dealing with mental illness to prevent people from shooting up schools. That's not where it needs to start. That's a lot like closing the barn door after the horse is gone. We need to stop it before they get there. We had five people killed in Texas including an infant. That guy's in the wind. Don't know where he is. And recently, our General Assembly, bless their hearts, there's a group pushing for what they call constitutional carry, which will allow anybody without any oversight to buy a weapon. Does it sound like that would be a smart thing for people to do who are concerned about people getting shot up every day? Do we need more mentally ill people who are gun obsessed out there buying more weapons? I don't think so. Now, there's I've got a copy here of the military, or pardon me, the Militia Act of 1792. Now this act was early in the nation's history. It was, uh, I think it says the second, second Congress session where they lay out what a militia is, what its responsibilities are, what the militia men are supposed to carry, bring with them, and so on. It is 
it, it definitely does not imply that a rump group who disagrees with the government has the right to go out and create a secession. <clears throat> now, Mr. Saunders, 30 seconds. Prayers and good wishes are fine, but something needs to be done today, not tomorrow. We need to do something concrete quickly to stop this madness. And that's what it is. It is madness. If I, if I hurt anybody's feeling that feel like they have the right to own a gun and carry it anywhere they want to at any time, I'm sorry, but you don't. Thank you. Kevin Price. I'm sure y'all know who I am. I'm Kevin Price, and I live on 1819 Old Cedar Falls Road here in Asheboro. I have listened to all the stuff that has been said and done. And by the way, it just blows my mind when people uh, that might say, I'm a Christian, I'm this, I'm that, I know the Lord. But they never read the part where it says, when you call somebody a fool, you're in danger of hellfire. Now, I know that's in the Bible because I've read it. But you know, Jesus rode a donkey. Was he a fool? Nope. He wasn't a fool. And you know what? The good thing about it was he helped everybody. And I can't say that about y'all. And I hate that. I cannot say that about this Randolph County Commissioner. And you said you got to say it to everybody, so I'm talking to everybody up here. I don't think that if you treated, I really believe if you treated everybody fairly, if you treated everybody with respect, if you treated everybody like the, uh, the Pledge of Allegiance said, with liberty and justice for all, you know, and I know, liberty and justice is not for all. But if we say liberty and justice for white people, Everybody would applaud because they know you got white privilege everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, but in Randolph County. You've got it everywhere, even Randolph County. That's what I meant to say. So my thing today is, hey, you know, you made this decision, and you know that that monument outside says liberty and justice for whoever you think deserves liberty and justice. We ought to all deserve liberty and justice. We shouldn't care about who's, what your color is, what your nationality is, or what your religion is. Now, I spoke a lot about religion. I'm a child of God, and I don't care who knows it. But I'm telling you, I think we need to look at some of the things that's been done with this group of people you can make a change, and I guarantee you, you can do more with everybody than you can just a few people. Thank you. Okay, that concludes those that have signed up for public comment tonight. So we will now take up our regular agenda, and we will begin with our consent agenda. <clears throat> It is rather lengthy. Is there any item that a commissioner would like to uh, have considered separately? Hearing none, do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I move we approve the consent agenda. I have a second. I'll second. Those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. And the consent agenda is passed. Our first new business item tonight is to consider strategic planning funding application <coughs> for the George Washington Carver College, Clyde Faust. Uh, welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. 
Can I give each one of you one of these? Is that okay? Sure. Okay. Good afternoon or good evening. My name is Clyde Faust. I'm also the um, chairman of the George Washington Carver Community Enrichment Center Board of Directors. And last year, we started something that I feel is truly amazing. It's an after-school arts-centered <laughs> program centered or focusing on middle school kids. The reason we created it was simple. When I was in elementary school, I was really good. I figured stuff out really quickly. I, was, it was, I could do my homework at the last minute and I could still turn it in and get an A. Elementary school was great. When you got to middle school and it got harder, I did not learn those homework skills, those study skills that you need if it just doesn't come, when things don't just come to you naturally. And so instead of digging in and, and, and becoming a better student, I became the class clown. And that went on to follow me from middle school to high school, into college. And so what we did was we said, man, what could we do that could help other kids that fell into the same situation? And so what we created was an arts-centered after-school program. Now, why the arts? We did the arts because I'm a photographer. How many people in here, if you're, if you're a photographer, then you remember back in the day, you had to have a little roll of 35 millimeter or two and a quarter film if you wanted to take pictures. You needed to have that film, you need to have it developed. Well, guess what? That went the way of the dodo bird. Nobody's using that anymore. But that is really every type of industry out there. Nobody is going to be doing business five years from now the way that they're doing business now. And the arts teach you how to think outside the box. The arts teach you how to be original. The arts teach you how to speak up for yourself, how to have self-confidence. And so what we did was we teamed up with communities and schools, Asheboro City Schools, and the city of Asheboro. And what we did, we got communities and schools to go and help us find retired teachers that would help create a foundation for those after school, for those um, study habits that I, that I sort of failed at when I was in middle school. Some professional teachers who were gonna come in and who were gonna help these kids in middle school get those study habits that are so important. And then the second part of the day is we're bringing in professional artists. In theater, we work with Rhino League Productions and they bring in professionals in the, in the theater department. We work with um, artists from, GW, I mean, from UNC Greensboro who brought in professionals who teach dance at the, at the college. We brought in professionals. Right now, they, they have professional um, painters who are painting a mural for Russell Murphy who was a, um, um, a, a community leader back in the 1970s and 80s. And, People that are after school program are actually helping to create that mural. So the idea is to get the kids to come in after school and here's another thing too, I'm a single parent. And when I came home from school, when I was a kid, my parents worked from nine in the morning to nine at night. When I came home from school, I went straight in the house and I'm supposed to do my homework. I'm gonna tell y'all a little secret. I didn't do my homework. <laughs> when I came home from school, it was about four o'clock and Batman and Robin was coming on and I was gonna watch that first, okay? I'm just telling you what happened. What we've done is Asheboro City Schools has created a bus stop right at the center. So now kids from North Asheboro Middle and kids from South Asheboro Middle can just get on the bus. Parents don't have to get off work and bring their kids. And then we made it so it cost the parents $25 every three months. So those kids are going to get training from professional teachers. They're going to get training from professional artists, and they get a hot meal and a snack, and it's only costing the parents $25 a month. And to be honest, the only reason we put the fee on there was because we felt like if we made it totally free to the parents, they wouldn't really respect it. And we wanted them, we wanted the kids to get the total experience of being able, for instance, to be able to be taught theater from people who have practiced their craft on Broadway, for instance. We got an email, the first nine-week report, and what we got in that email was, was, it touched my heart. Of the kids that go to the program, 
Two of them were already straight-A students. And we were happy to hear that those two kids continue to be straight-A students. Yay! The part that made us feel really good was every student. Every student that wasn't already making an A in every class brought each one of their grades up at least a letter grade. That's what this program is designed to do. That's how this program works. And it couldn't happen without the help of Asheboro City Schools, Asheboro City, Rhino Lee, and Communities and Schools. We're asking you for a $10,000 grant. And the reason is because it's expensive to do what we're doing. We're not asking volunteers to come in and work with these kids. We're asking professionals to come in, and those professionals want to be paid. Not only do we have professional educators come in, we hire tutors from the, I mean interns from Asheboro City Schools from the high school, and they will come in and they work with the kids. For instance, I'll give you a perfect example, something that I didn't know. When a kid doesn't turn in his homework, a lot of times the kid feels like he's, he's rejected and he just takes the zero. It doesn't cross his mind to call that teacher and talk to that teacher about being able to turn in this work. Can I turn in this work late? Late is better than a zero. And even if the teacher says no, that conversation leads to, well, is there anything that I can do to help or to um, any extra credit that I can do to help bring this grade up? All of our students are having those kind of conversations now. Some of them hadn't even thought about having those kind of, kind of conversations before. And even when they're out of middle school, trust me, those types of conversations with your educators, with your teachers and your principals and your boss can go a long way into helping you get a lot farther in life. And so what I want to do right now, I've given you an overview of what we do. I'm going to ask you to, to listen to two people. One is going to be our, um, our head educator, the young lady who deals with the kids every day. And the next is going to be a young lady who lives in the county and brings her granddaughter to our program because we don't have a bus from the county. She lives in the county, but she brings her granddaughter to our program every day, and she can talk to you about what she has seen in her own child in, the term, in terms of the effectiveness of the program. So please, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to ask Ms. Sarah Watson, if she'll please come up. I'm going to brag on Ms. Watson a little bit, because when she started, I was under the impression, I'm a numbers guy. And so I was under the impression we would put this together and it would work. And Ms. Watson came in and she said, wow, I like what you're doing, but it won't work. <laughs> and the reason it won't work is because y'all ain't going to believe this. All kids are different. All kids are different. If we had just put a volunteer that would help the kids with their homework, it wouldn't work. You need someone who understands kids, who understands that, that Ch Commissioner Hayward is different than Commissioner Fry and they understand how to work with Commissioner Fry and how to motivate Commissioner Hayward. That's what a professional teacher can do with kids. A professional teacher knows how to get the most out of a kid's potential. A volunteer doesn't know that because they haven't been trained in that. And we got one of the best communities and schools, I will tell you, sent us their best when they sent us Ms. Watson. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good evening. My name is Sarah Watson. Sarah. My name is Sarah Watson, and I am a retired teacher. Um, this is my 49th year. Don't do the math. I'd like to tell you what we have done and the successes that we have seen with our students. We provide academic support in a variety of ways, and the results have been rewarding and encouraging to the students and to us. A shy student came to us passing four subjects with flying colors but failing two others miserably. We have addressed those two subjects, and one is now passing, and we're looking at the other subject. A third subject grade has improved because the student has access to a computer at the center to practice an online program that her school uses and she does not have access to computer at home. A third uh, subject grade has improved because of that. We have two other students who had straight A's the second grading period due again to having access to the computers at the center and no distraction from younger siblings at home. One of the children has become a bit of a reader in part due to the influence of the mobile library that we've had to come visit uh, two or three times. Uh, so we're reinforcing the tremendous value of reading. 
We have two very young students who have tried to be student athletes this year. They were absent from us during that time period and their grades plummeted. Upon their return to us, we reminded them that they must pass their current subjects to participate in sports next year. It's remarkable to me as a former teacher that a lot of students just don't <laughs> comprehend that, that what you're doing today matters tomorrow. We're trying to support them as they learn how to juggle schoolwork with sports that they love. To that end, we monitor their grades regularly. We have signed permission from the parents to look at their grades online, and we ask them what their grades are reflecting. We reiterate that work due to absences, shockingly to them, it must be made up. Zeros don't just go away. We try to determine what interfered with their completing classwork because it's often classwork and participation that's caused their grades. We encourage them to advocate for themselves by asking the teacher if missing work can be made up and to eliminate the distractions, which in likelihood is themselves in class. Often the work has been made up and the grades improve. So in other words, we are teaching good work habits and good study habits. The students tell us that coming to the center provides a place where they can focus on their schoolwork without irresistible distractions that they might have at home. Their time with us concludes with an excellent hour of art of a varied type. The first session was theater during which the students wrote a play after learning stage directions and performed for their parents. The second session was dance in which they learned dance routines. The third session they wrote songs with a music producer. Currently they're learning visual art techniques. The artists who have come this year are superb. I cannot sing their praises enough. The children are receiving a very rich experience. And I just want to say that I believe in this program and what it's doing for the students who regularly attend. Very good. Thank you. What, what Ms. Watson touched on is that the arts are about lighting, lighting sparks getting people excited about something. It might not be theater, it might not be dance, it might not be art, but if, if it's anything that they get excited in, once they get motivated and they get passionate, they enjoy their time there much better. They enjoy their time in school much better. And to talk about that, I want to give you the other side of the coin, to talk to you, to, to let you see how a parent feels about the program. So I'm going to ask Ms. Shirley Miller if she would come up and talk about she is the grandparent of one of the students, and she actually takes the time to drive her granddaughter to our program every day. Ms. Miller. Yes. Hello, I'm Shirley Miller, and I'm the grandmother of Jolie Beth, okay? So my granddaughter, she's very smart, but some kids need more time, more attention. Their uh, learning span is not as quickly as other kids. So when my granddaughter came to live with her father, uh, it was a big transition, but we knew we had to do something. When we got her report card, I almost fainted. She was failing her grades. I was so discouraged, so we um, got a meeting with the teacher. We talked with the teacher, wasn't understanding if my granddaughter's been failing, why have no one reached out to my son or myself? So after that meeting with the teacher, I was so distressed and I told my son, hey, Jaron, let's get Jolie into this after school program that Chip was telling me about. When I tell you guys, my granddaughter was failing. I mean, there was no hope for the next grade. When she got into the class, into the program with uh, Chip, the after school program. I was so excited. She was, I could see a change. She was so eager to learn. She would always say, Nana, we learned this, we learned that. You know, she was more excited about school. So as I began to um, talk with the teachers, Ms. Watson and um, Mr. Edward, I had to meet who was teaching my granddaughter because I'm just that protective grandmother. And I want to make sure, you know, she's going to learn. We're gonna push it this way. We got to do something so that she can excel in school. When I tell you guys, it's working. 
I met with the teacher and I was so excited. My granddaughter had brought her grace up. Not one, but two. She brought the Fs up to Cs and Bs. I was like, oh my goodness, I was excited. I said, oh baby, it's working, you know. The teachers, they're taking time out. They show her that they care. And when, if this, <laughs> if this thing was going on, class was going on, when I was going in school, I probably wouldn't have had to retain my grade, you know? It's working. They take time with the kids. They're one-on-one. -on -one. She's reading like never before. And I just want to say that this works for any kids that are struggling in school. Thank you for your time. Where, where is she in school? Okay, my granddaughter goes to Randleman Elementary School. So when I went with Chip, I got a little nervous and he said, well, it's for Asheboro City, but he turned no children away. So I am the grandmother that said it doesn't matter. To get her to this after school program, we will bring her every day. We bring her every day and pick her up. She comes home every evening with a hot meal. I said, what is that? Man, I got nuggets one day. I mean, it's a buffet there. <laughs> I mean, it, it, this works. So I hope you guys will see it in your heart to give this grant because it's all about the children. It's all about the children. And if more kids had this one-on-one, -on -one, so many kids wouldn't be failing and quitting school. Thank you for your Thank time. You. Thank Very you. Good. Thank you, Ms. Miller. Chip, um, do you pick up any other hmm? from county? Do you pick up from any other county schools? We, we we don't have an agreement with the county to pick up as of now, but we we can we can definitely look at that or, or set that up. One thing I did want to say real quick about um, this is the reason it's focused on middle school kids is because that's when we make the decisions that are really important. The decisions that you know, a seventh grader can make a decision that will affect them in ninth grade and twelfth grade, and they can make bad decisions. We have we have um, one kid that comes around. He 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 comes around almost every week, and he's just sitting out in the parking lot. But he he made bad decisions earlier on, and he got kicked out of school, right? And so since he got kicked out, we can we don't have the process to be able to help him, right? Because we don't know what's going on with him, right? But my my point is that this program helps to stop other kids from making those same mistakes, basically. Now, I would love to answer any questions that anybody has, but if y'all want to unanimously vote to just approve the grant, I'll accept that too. <laughs> I, I, I think you just need to let us vote, Chip. Okay, y'all have a good day. Hey, Mr. Chairman, if I could, just, just a second. Um, I'm tickled to death to see that you guys are recognizing Russ Murphy. One of the nicest gentleman that's ever graced the face of this earth. And I'm tickled to death to see that you have you have recognized him. I, I think that is absolutely wonderful. That, I have a question. Uh, how do you involve Rhino Leaf in it? I, I'm, I'm kind of curious how that happened. Well, it was important that we, one of the things my father wanted, the reason my father wanted the building built was because he wanted to bring the arts to the east side. He wanted to, he wanted kids that grew up where I grew up to experience the arts rather than just really around sports. And so when we started looking at how are we gonna get artists that actually know what they're doing, right? It, um, then, you know, we wanted to deal with communities and schools because we didn't want just anybody, any volunteer to try and, and you know, help these kids with their homework. It wouldn't work. And we wanted the same thing with the artists. We didn't want just anybody who had time to do it or anybody who had a passion to do it. We wanted somebody who actually knew what they were talking about. And so Rhino Leap um, just so happened they came to us one day. They wanted to use our facility to host a program that they were having, to host a play that they were having. And while they were there, we were like, well, I'll tell you what, maybe we can work out a deal. If you can help us find quality artists to help us in these, to help us um, teach these kids, then we'll be glad to um, work with you on, on the rental space for the building. Because it's not just finding an artist, it's about finding a teacher that's an artist, because all of these artists have to be vetted 
by communities and schools, which is a reason why we love working with Asheville City Schools and communities and schools, because everybody goes through that process so that we're certain that the people who have access to these kids are of the highest caliber. And so that's, that's how they got involved. Any other questions for Chip? Well, I've just, uh, Rhino Leaf uh, does, uh, obviously does plays and those kind of things. Mm -hmm. uh, do they do, I, I'm sorry, I don't know this. Mm -hmm. Do they do, they, uh, do uh, movie type things? Or I don't think they do movie type things, but what it is when you're producing a play, they produce promotional materials for the play. And, and because they're artists, they, they work in that sphere. For instance, the dance, the, the dance instructor, Rhino Leaf got us the dance instructor. And the reason that they, they have, you know, that's, the dance instructor isn't someone who works in theater, but because they needed choreography for their plays, they knew this young lady who was an educator at UNCG. And they talked to her and they got her to come in and be the, um, the instructor for our dance portion of the group, okay? Anybody else? Thank you. Oh, and guys, you got to come to the unveiling. It's going to be at Russell Murphy Park on Frank Street, and they're they're taking the outhouse and their um, or the, the 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 facilities house there, and they're putting the mural on all four sides of it. And our kids are helping to paint it, but it's it's honoring Mr. Um, Mr. Russell, Russell Murphy. All right. Thanks. Those, so those of us that might not know Russ Murphy, and I don't know who wouldn't hardly, but he was a fine gentleman on and off the court his way and very very much a leader and boy if you could get anybody uh, kids to follow what Russ Murphy is all about you're doing good I'll remind the board this request is for st our strategic planning money that's uh, for those of you that might not follow that process and uh, Mr. Bob Peeler here to, is here tonight from uh, waste management that's the money that we have from our landfill contract and we decided several years ago to set those funds aside for strategic planning just like the request that Mr. Faust has brought to us tonight. So uh, that is a request that uh, this funding would be part of our strategic planning. So I will uh, ask for the board if there's no other questions or comments. I'd just like to say two quick things. One, Mr. Faust, I would appreciate it if you would um, send us um, information if something special is going on, if they're doing a presentation or something like that. I mean, we all have busy schedules, but it might be that, um, you know, that some of us could come, and I would like that very much. And I would concur that you hit the jackpot when you got Sarah Watson. <laughs> What's well, the pleasure of the board? Well, I'd like to make a motion to approve the request of the George Washington Carver College incorporated for $10,000 in strategic planning funds and the associated budget amendment. Is there a second to the motion? I'd be glad to second that. All right, further discussion? Those in favor of the motion, let it be known by saying aye. No. Aye, opposed no, and it passes unanimously. Thank you, Chip. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Next item is uh, item B. This is a, a waiver of the uh, American Healthcare Debt Service for Randolph Hospital, and um, I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask Commissioner Allen to to uh, well. Tim, you go ahead with your presentation, okay. and then, I'm, then I'll ask Commissioner Allen to uh, sort of respond for the county tonight. Okay. Thank you, Chairman Fry. My name is Tim Ford. I'm the Chief Executive Officer of Randolph Health, American Healthcare Systems. Can everybody hear me okay? <laughs> well, we might want to wait a I can Let's pause. Yeah. I'll pause a minute. Thank okay. you. I'll, I'll continue now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so we were asked um, to by Hal Johnson to provide information 
that shows that we are meeting and actually exceeding the covenants required for the loan agreement and the promissory note. Um, I believe I sent to Hal Johnson a uh, letter explaining with each point that was required and how we meet that requirement. Some of those excerpts are actually from the State uh, Department of Facility Services license uh, from the hospital as uh, written evidence. But just briefly, we, um, we do have five, continue to operate five operating rooms. We have one dedicated for uh, C-sections for obstetrics. Um, we do operate 24-7 emergency department. We maintain 20 beds or uh, stretchers there. Um, let's see, and also as far as inpatients, we include uh, the requirements of an intensive care unit. In fact, we, we increased that from four beds to 10 beds. Uh, about a year ago, we have general surgery, orthopedic surgery, and complete uh, maternity and obstetric and GYN services at the hospital. And I will point out, it's at a time when a lot of community hospitals and smaller hospitals are cutting back on uh, maternal and child health just because of finances. So, you know, I'll fight to keep that in our hospitals <laughs> as long as I draw breath. I think it's extremely important to, to care in the community to have those services available close by. As far as the radiologic and diagnostic lab services, we do continue to have two MRI uh, equipment. One is outpatient, one inpatient. We have actually picked up an additional um, computer tomography or CT scanner. We did replace the old uh, ED CT scanner, with, of course, the help of the, the county funds. And we also purchased the a CT angiography unit which can, is a 256 slice machine, which is the most advanced there is in the hospital setting. Um, you know, to get anything higher, it's research-based. Um, and we also, of course, continue to have the outpatient CT. So we, we meet and, and exceed that covenant. We provide on-site 24-7 lab services for probably about 85% of lab tests that need to be done uh, some of them do go to LabCorp or will be sent out to what's called a reference lab, but we have actually added some of the tests that we do in the last two years. And again, that's available 24-7. Um, we continue to provide radi radiation oncology services. Yeah, that's in a part, we continue that partnership with Cone. Uh, we are 60% owner of the radiation section. Cone is 40%. And as you all know, Cone has moved their medical oncology or chemotherapy services down the street. Um, and eventually, I think you heard that they will build a new facility off of Spiro Road. And that will, uh, but in the meantime, we will maintain those services in the community. And I believe their site is within the 10 mile requirement. Let's see. We do have. Uh, regular meetings, we, we try, make every effort to meet bi-monthly, sometimes it stretches out. In fact, we did not have the one this month because we're anticipating having the audit to present at the May meeting, so we thought we'd just wait until we can do that, but consistently we've had bi-monthly meetings. Um, you do have two representatives on that board, Daryl Fry and David Allen, uh, that are on that board. Um, so, you know, to the best of my understanding, and uh, Randolph Health has performed and exceeded um, each covenant uh, required in the promissory note and the loan agreement. If anyone has any questions or comments, please feel free. I serve on the board along with Chairman Fry, and, um, you know, I congratulate you on the, all of the uh, logistical and the keeping services open, those kinds of things. But where, where I have and it's probably communication issues and whatnot, mm -hmm. but where I do have issues are covenants for, uh, well, uh, B, and e, B and E. And I think some of that in, in D has been remedied by providing the quarterly reports, but for the first 18 months, we got no written financial information mm -hmm. uh, other than we're, we're doing well, but there was no detailed financial, 
I think in December we got the audit report uh, and indicated, you know, from the auditor that, mm -hmm. and this is where I'm getting to my point, is that we are on a, a board, but I think that the understanding of the LGC, which was part of this requirement, would that, that would be the board of directors. Mm -hmm. What's, can you help me understand the nature of the board that we serve on? The board is, is a board, the Randolph board is, is required by the covenants and is made up by members of this community and, and the two um, county commissioners and also members of American Healthcare System, chosen by American Healthcare System. Um, you know, that board is, you know, we go over operations, quality, uh, financials uh, at each of those quarterly meetings. If the request is that we have something more specific or if you request certain information for the covenants, we can arrange, we can do that. But we, we thought we, we were using the uh, minutes of that board um, and the um, discussions at that board to you know, get input from anyone on that board and provide information on all those key areas of hospital operations, as I mentioned. But it, it's not the board of directors. It's not the board that's charged with governance. Is that it's, right? it's the, the owner is ultimately in charge of governance. The, but this board um, is a working, functioning board. You don't have ultimate re responsibility for the operations. But I think we were led to believe when we signed these covenants, it specifically mentions uh, board of directors. Well, it, and to give it is voting, for this for voting, this specific. We, we're to give mm -hmm. voting uh, mm -hmm. to have voting rights. Mm -hmm. I don't know that we voted on anything. No, we have. <clears throat> well, you know, certainly. And part of the reason that the LGC put these requirements in was so that the county could have some supervision and responsibility for. the the twelve million dollars, I think, mm -hmm. I don't know where we're exactly at. I know we had three million dollars that went out uh, initially back in July of 2021. Uh, that was used for operating capital, and that was mm -hmm. another. We thought it was for ca uh, operating. It was. We thought it was for capital improvements, but it was used for operating. Water under the bridge there, but mm -hmm. I guess my concern is that. It was my understanding, and, and I think this board's understanding, that we would have voting rights on the board of directors. Now, AHS is a uh, LLC mm -hmm. corporate, or, or in, mm -hmm. uh, in Virginia. It is a member managed. So there is no board of directors for AHS. So I'm not sure how we remedy, and I'm not an attorney. I sit beside one <laughs> occasionally. Uh, and I have stayed at Holiday Inn Express, but I'm not sure how we remedy that because I think at least, and, and Chairman Fry, you might want to, and the board as well, my understanding is that we would have two voting delegates or two board members appointees mm -hmm. or, or appointees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We haven't voted on anything. We haven't, we haven't had any, typically on a board of directors, you'd have a capital improvement plans, you would have those come before the board. The, the CEO would typically report to the board. Yeah, and you know, I think we do have those reports of, again, finance, operations, uh, the chief medical but officer there, reports. My, my point is, sir, there's no authority with it. You're, you're informing us, but well, there's no governance. I think that the LGC and this board thought that this board would be the board that governs the hospital. Hmm. Also, uh, yeah. Bishop uh, Trogdon, who did our invocation night, is also, he's still in the audience, and he's also one of our appointed or, mm -hmm. or right. uh, presented members to that board also. And I think he Correct. would have an interest in this and agree that we don't vote on anything, we don't see anything. Um, well, I think we can make improvements to the board process. We can allow for, um, for <clears throat> voting on certain certain items. So I think that's probably, you know, we're, it's probably a work in progress. And I think, you know, giving, getting your input, we can improve and, that. And don't get me wrong. We're not looking to run the hospital. No. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's but, a different, it's a, it's a different arrangement. But we just want to know it's being run. We won't be well, being run. And, and that we have 
uh, at yeah. least uh, a voice in the decision making. Okay, you mean? Because I believe it's a 14 member board, mm -hmm. and I think there is uh, two commissioners, uh, Reverend Trogdon, Trogdon. Uh, Bill Redding, and Dr. Bill Redding, mm -hmm. and John Redding. John, Redding. John Redding. I'm sorry, John yeah. Redding. Yeah. And who's the other? Is there one more? The lady from the county schools that, that filled a slot for the Hispanic population that we were asked to, to provide. Like, so, and, you know, certainly we're not looking to run no, the board, but we would no. like to have, okay. and according to the okay. covenants that, we, that were signed, it's, it's a board of directors, well, not, yeah, a, it's, not, a, and not an advisor board. And yeah, for true. example, when we did get the audit, the, the auditor was very careful to refer to us, the board, as an advisory board, not as a governing board. And there is a difference as an auditor, mm -hmm. uh, as well that uh, he's re required to give to those who govern are charged with governance. He's supposed to get, we're supposed to get a letter. We never, never got that. So that's my concern: is that we're not really a governing board; we're an advisory board, and I don't think that was well, the intent. Of the yeah, we're getting into you know again the legal. It, it's a it's a different type of, of arrangement. Um, I think we can use that board meeting to serve the purpose you, you know, we need to meet the intent. Be glad to do that. Um, so be glad to take suggestions back to the owner and uh, Mike Sarian and see what we can do to, to um, meet the covenants. We certainly want to do that. And we want, want to you know, make you feel part of those board meetings and we certainly, I guess, imply that your your approval you accept what we're we're doing you see what how we're operating um, but if you need more specifics please let me know because we certainly intend to to meet the covenant i just think we had different expectations of that covenant now, along with lgc if you probably ask the members there yeah their theirs was not to be in an advisory capacity but to be in uh, a governance capacity okay i will you know i'll take that back to chairman mike Sarian. yes um, I'm the CFO at Randolph, and um, I think most of you know me. Uh, we have corrected that with the auditors as far as the advisory board. They do realize that was a misspeak, and that's why we moved the meeting to May so that y'all could vote on the financials. And you will be presented with, <clears throat> excuse me, with the letter at that time. So we have corrected that. We realized that afterwards, but um, they're fully aware that y'all are a voting board. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. No. no. <laughs> Another question from the board? Comments? Uh, I, I would just say that um, government money comes with a lot of um, accountability. It's different from, from public monies. Um, it's very different. And um, I think that even enters into, you know, some of the other discussions that we are having right now on other topics. When you get government money, there's just a lot of strings, a lot of accountability, mm -hmm. and, um, and so we just need to be judicious in that. Sure. So I appreciate you, um, you know, working to correct that so that we can in good faith sure. um, serve our citizens well. Yeah, this is quite a unique arrangement. It's really never been done before. The, the Rural Stabilization Act was, was done, I think, with the specific intent of trying to help Randolph community. And so this is, this is new, unique legislation, and we certainly can work together to, to make it work for us. Because again, we certainly meet, want to meet the intent. Um, does our attorney or our finance officer have any anything you want to say to this, Ben? No. I mean, I, I think what I hear Mr. Ford saying, and I appreciate the situation that he's in, but I think I, what I hear him saying is that there's not a board. I mean, yeah. I, I think that's... Well, as there's, an LLC, there's... there's, 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 there's I think what I hear him saying is that there's not another board that's meeting making these decisions. No. You know, the group that we have now is clearly not voting on those decisions. Those decisions are coming from one person. Yes. Yes.
so th the consideration for this board is do we officially waive the debt service under the agreement, under our contract with the hospital, do we waive that uh, debt service uh, to the Rural Health Care Stabilization Loan Fund um, based on the information that's been presented to us uh, with the question of the, the voting powers? And I would add to that, and Will, what, what sort of uh, timeline have we got here relative to taking official action? Well, the amount that the county owes UNC Health uh, comes due this month. We took the loan out, I think it was May the 24th of last year, so the first payment's May 24th of this year. And what's the first payment? That's the first payment. But how much is it? It's one million plus the 1% uh, interest, so okay. 1,120,000. We're gonna make that regardless of who we have the forgiveness or not. So, I mean, yeah, that's, yeah, that's already budgeted, and that, that will that payment will be made here in the, in the next week or so. And the only other recourse that, that we have until this is, I think, adequately resolved to for the this board and, and the board that that the works for the hospital, there our advisory board, is to not pay the invoices sent to us until we have that cleared up. I mean, that's, that's the only recourse that, that we would have in this process. I'm, and I'm not saying well, that's what we're going to do. I'm just saying yeah. if, if, we're, if we don't have, and maybe we won't know until, when is that board meeting? May the 18th. May the 18th. Mm -hmm. That's six days before the money's due to see what kind of um, vote we take, what sort of documents are presented to us and what kind of vote we take that we participate in. Mm -hmm. Well, again, I, my feeling is, you know, um, the intent is, again, through those board meetings that we provide full information, opportunity to question uh, the operations. Um, we do provide in, uh, financial information. Um, and we are correcting at least that uh, situation with the financial statements that those will take, we will take a vote and recognition by the auditors this is not an advisory board. And at least that will be voted on. So we're making strides to, to make this arrangement work positively for all of us. And again, just, just for the, the citizens, those that are present, those that might be watching, um, some of this has been a couple of years now, uh, actually, uh, you know, a little over two years mm -hmm. since, since we started this process. Um, in the hospital, our previous hospital was in bankruptcy, and we worked with the American Healthcare Systems to purchase Randolph Hospital out of bankruptcy, keep the hospital open, keep it serving patients, providing services, delivering babies, accepting ambulances when they come to the, to the to present at the emergency room, um, that we agreed to borrow $12 million to help defer the organizational expenses to the hospital. It was to be for capital, meaning brick and mortar, uh, assets, uh, scanning machines, et cetera, that would qualify as, as a capital purchase. Um, we have started making some of those, mm -hmm. and um, the first three million did not go for capital. It was used to pay nurses. It was used to hire more nurses, and I understand that. Nurses at the hospital hadn't had a pay increase in years. We were losing uh, nurses every day and in order to keep the hospital open and provide services we had to have nurses mm -hmm. so but the official knowledge or acknowledgement of that took over a year to to get and that has that has caused us to, to have a little angst about this process but um, and in that legislation UNC hospital was given responsibility over their objections to monitoring that loan. So it's a, it was a $12 million loan. 
with 12 payments, 12 annual payments, with interest at 1%. And our first payment is due on Mar uh, May the 24th this month. So that's that's the situation that we're in. And, and again, um, the county and, and we've had we've had other discussions with with the principals involved at the hospital over just coming forth with information and letting us know what is going on, how well the hospital is, is it still going to be financially sound, going to continue to deliver services for the citizens of this of this county. That's why we did that. So, uh, and that's why we, we express our concerns right now is, uh, and we've made our point and, and to the comments that have been made to us, I guess um, May the 18th will tell if in fact we are given voting voting rights, voting responsibilities, and proper documentation upon which to vote. So that's, 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 what's, that's the issue that's before this board right now. That, that's, that's where we are in this process. And I think we've probably paid out, we'll appoint a couple million more. I'm sorry. Yeah, where we are. Where we are on the 12. I think you, the uh, hospital's pulled down three million Plus something like that. Yes. But we paid for Close. one machine is a little over a million, a scanner, right? That's correct. Yes. So and various other pieces of equipment. We'd probably have advanced about five million dollars, give or take, to this point. So we still have seven million dollars <laughs> in the county in the county's holding for the hospital. Well, and we do have some invoices pending right now. Yes. I see. And we have some more to go. So, you know, a lot of, lot of old equipment and uh, some services we want to add to the community. Right now, we're, we're taking shipment on dialysis machines, which will allow patients to be able to have inpatient dialysis when they're sick. Or if they come in and need to have dialysis, they'll be able to have it here, not have to go to Greensboro or High Point. So that's what we're using the equipment for. And you mentioned nurses. Um, we were, were probably one of the few hospitals in the country that are, have all um, staff nurses. We don't have any more traveling nurses. I think every hospital in the country would be jealous of us. So we are making quite a bit of progress. Uh, we try to get those reports out, the new equipment, uh, our strategic efforts. We try to, I, at least in my report, I try to bring things, those things to the board. And certainly if anybody has any questions, you know, that's the opportunity. But if we need to firm that up with the covenants, let's, let's work on it. Mr. Chairman, would it make sense to defer this to the June meeting? Yes. Yeah. Uh, May or June? Oh, the, your, your, your our, June meeting. Our June meeting. Okay. we get through the okay, gotcha. May 18th meeting. We, we, um, we're not going to default on, on our payment, but it's the, the forgiveness part of it is what's yet gotcha. to be determined by this right. board. And a lot of that will will be determined by the outcome of the May 18th meeting. Well, I think you can see that you know this hospital hospital management is is committed to caring for this community. We, you know, we haven't had knock on wood any any COVID inpatients in about two weeks now, but we had up to 20, 25, and we we didn't sip them off. We managed it. So this hospital's been here. We want to continue to grow, provide services needed in the community. And, you know, we're, we're committed to this community. Well, and we're committed too. So yeah, that, absolutely. that's what yeah, we I, have responsibilities right, for Right, let's, um, let's just figure out how to make this, you know, this work. I, I think from the get-go, the county has shown we were committed to keeping the doors of that hospital open. Absolutely. Even to the point of borrowing $12 million to see that that happened. Now, I do want to say again in full transparency to, to the citizens, the owners, the new owners of Randolph Hospital decided to operate as a for-profit hospital. In all the years, almost 90 years of operation at that hospital, it was a not-for-profit. Now what that means is Randolph Hospital today had to pay property taxes. And they paid to the county about $517,000 in property taxes earlier this year. Um, 
Thank you for pointing no that out. No hospital <laughs> in the county has ever paid property taxes. So they did, they did and um, there was discussion in that process as well, but they were, they were paid. So I, I, do, I do want to make the citizens aware of that also. So um, then I guess we, uh, we will bring this item back at our June meeting, uh, giving us a chance to participate in the uh, May 18th board meeting. Okay. All right. Anybody else got anything? Okay. So rather than acting on this particular issue today, we're going to take it to the June meeting? Yep. yep. So as of now, we haven't officially forgiven the debt. Gotcha. <laughs> okay. okay. Am I understand yeah. where we are? And I will say I appreciate the work on the staffing with the nurses. I recently read a piece about, um, you know, about that nationwide and what mm -hmm. it looks like. And um, there are hospitals where CEOs are making lots of money and they're not hiring nurses. So I appreciate Not in our case, I can no, <laughs> I know that. I know that. And so I just would like to say how much I appreciate that because if you don't have good staff in there, people won't come. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next item, C. Thank you, Thank you sir. I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you, Tim. I'm sorry. Yeah. Very much. The uh, consider renewing the Medico contract for medical services at the detention center. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Randolph County Sheriff's Office has reviewed the contract renewal with Medico Incorporated, mm -hmm. which is our current inmate medical care provider, and we wish to renew that contract with Medico. As a part of that contract renewal, we are requesting an additional licensed nurse practitioner. This additional position would be responsible for completing medication distribution, medical screenings during intake. There is currently only one LPN who does those duties in addition to doing the daily inmate medical sick calls and attending emergent medical needs of the inmates. This new position would provide additional coverage Monday through Friday. There's also a staffing matrix there. It simply just shows eight hours a day, Monday through Friday, which was when generally medical is the busiest in the jail. That's when they do all of their screenings. So the cost to renew these services with Medico is $1,420,762 for the year, which comes to $118,397 per month. That financial breakdown for the base contract renewal is $926,390. The medication assisted treatment addition is the 382,940 and the LPN addition is 111,433,000. ,433 so in conclusion, if you approve this uh, contract with Medico for the 23-24 budget year, I just ask that you authorize the county manager to sign the contract renewal. Now, the MAT edition was approved earlier this year by this board. Is that, isn't that correct, Will? Yes, sir. The LPN uh, request is part of the funding request right now. It has not previously been approved. Correct. It's a part of your ask in renewing this contract. Yes. So, as far as Medico is concerned, it's the 900 and... $26,390. The contract that Medico has submitted encompasses all three of the services. The uh, LPN is really a request on behalf of Medico so they can keep up with the medication distribution, the medical screenings, the sick calls, and the emergent medical needs of the inmates in the jail. 
Mm. So in the contract that they have submitted, the contract amendment for the new um, year encompasses all three of those items. I also brought nurse Michelle Honig, who is our head nurse at the jail, and she can answer any questions that anyone has about the LPN and the need for that if you have questions. What was our contract last year? The contract last year for our base was 899407 so the difference for the base was $26,982. So let me ask you, it says the total is 24 hours. So does this um, make it 20, like 24 hour care? I wish it did. Yeah, but that's why I asked the question. No. and. That's why I asked Nurse Michelle to come so she could explain it. Um, most of the, all of the sick calls are done during the day. And so when we have the psychiatrist, our um, doctor, all of those services are done during the day. So that's when they need the most of the staffing. Um, I'm going to let her answer so the other questions. The staffing there when you need it. Correct. Right. Okay. Would you like her to explain the staffing matrix? Yes. So I'm uh, Michelle Honig, RN and Healthcare Service Administrator for Randolph County Detention Center's Medical Department. So right now our staffing matrix calls for 2.8 FT, which rounds to three full-time employees. So our employees work eight-hour shifts, um, so that's one on-day shift, one LPN, and it allots me for two LPNs on the second shift. They cannot work more than five days a week because that's over 40 hours. So that leaves a hole every other weekend from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. because I don't have it in my matrix. So currently we're using PRN staffing, um, agency staffing, uh, regional nurses from Medico that come and travel through all, all our sites. Uh, I brought some statistics with us just from the months of January, February, March and April that shows you how many people get brought into the jail. So for January, 497 inmates, February, 445 inmates, March, 568 inmates, and April, 485. Those are the amount of people that are brought into the jail throughout um, that month. We are responsible for seeing every single person who comes into that jail, and theoretically, we'd like to see them within three to four hours to ensure that they're safe and they don't have emergent medical needs that need to be addressed immediately, and if foregone, could cause you know, serious medical issues, lawsuits, and prolonged hospitalizations. Just the amounts of medications that were given. So this is the number of pills for January. It was 13,428. How many? How many? Say that again. 13,428. The number of scripts for January was 1,458 medication scripts that we um, prescribed through our provider. I know you guys are familiar with our detox checks from the MAP proposal, um, but in January, the amount of opioid detoxers were 391, alcohol, 151 detox checks. Labs and diagnostics for January, 76. So that includes we do EKGs, um, we do all blood work, we do x-rays in-house, ultrasounds in-house, all to save uh, money uh, from having to send them out to get these procedures done. Um, and the month of March was probably our busiest since we had 568 people brought into the jail. Um, we also do sick calls where, you know, if the inmate gets sick, we have to see them and address their needs. Those are typically try to be done uh, within 24 hours. If it's emergent, we see them right then on the spot. Um, but there was 148 non-emergent sick calls for that month. There was one. 16,804 pills that were given, 924 scripts, 453 de uh, opioid detox checks, 168 alcohol detox checks, and 125 uh, lab work and diagnostics done within-house. Um, and our, the amount, 
So usually a matrix is based off of your average daily population, so how many people stay in the jail. Our average daily population for Randolph County um, is relatively low in comparison to some others. However, we have a very high influx of inmates or people that get arrested and brought into jail that we have to see. So January was 238, February was 242, March was 267, April was 264. In comparison to um, Medico's sister site, uh, like Buncombe County, which is two times, three times the size of us, um, the amount of people that we bring into our jail is comparable to theirs when I met with their healthcare service administrator. Even though we do not keep them, we have a very high turnaround rate, we still have to see all of these people and make sure that they are okay and getting the help that they need. And that is why we're asking for the additional one LPN uh, to cover the shifts and make sure that we don't get behind in trying to ensure their health and well-being. On those pills, do they those. come in there with those pills or they're prescribed after they've So become... that, the, that number is a combination of both. Um, so they can come in with a script. We continue it. A lot of times medications need to be adjusted. Um, we have, like a lot of people, don't see doctors regularly on the outside. They can be hypertensive, have cardiac issues, and we address all of that while they're with us. Um, we have a provider that comes in once a week, and I overwhelm him with the amount of people that he sees on a weekly basis uh, for things that we call chronic care visits, which is any type of cardiovascular issue, hypertension, neurological problems, things that are um, life-threatening. So when he sees them, we do blood work on them, we adjust their medication, we continue monitoring them, we do EKGs on them, we order x-rays, ultrasounds, um, all which is included in the contract with Medico. Mm. And then when we see people for sick calls, we also prescribe medication and telepsychiatry is done once a week where a psychiatrist meets with the inmates and then he also prescribes medication. Mm. How much, if any, of that would be covered by Medicaid expansion? So I have already started doing research for Medicaid expansion, because I know you told me last time it was it's supposed to start in about six months. So I have spoken to my provider. I have registered myself with NC Tracks, um, so that way we can utilize Medicaid and it can be billed to them. And my provider is uh, registering himself with it. So as soon as he's done and I can continue my registration, the organization will be registered and we can start billing Medicaid um, instead of billing um, the county for medication. Are you saying Medicaid would pay part of this number? I don't know if it would pay for all of it, but Medicaid usually covers a portion. Um, other sites, Medico has sites in Virginia, mm -hmm. and in Virginia they're a Medicaid expansion site. Um, part of their statistics, I have to do a report every month, part of their report includes how many Medicaid applicants they've gotten, how many have been approved, how many are pending. And I know that they use um, Medicaid to bill for medications as well as like outside appointments, dental services, referrals. So it would help in the cost. We have a, um, there's a cost pool for medications, um, so it would lower the amount that we're spending on medications. So Medico covers is it 70,000 70, in medications. Um, so if we go over that, then the county has to pay the, rest, the remainder. So us using Medicaid to bill for medications would help prevent us from going over the number that Medico has said they are going to pay for. So if we go over certain limits, our bill goes beyond the, the million four on here. Not for the contract. Um, I don't know how to explain yeah. that. So with the, uh, call, the cost pool, um, that's for outside medical care, medications, all of that yeah. is in the cost pool. Yes. And so anything outside of that, there's also, they also have um, they scrub those bills, 
So we pay the lowest cost we can, um, kind of like another insurance company. Um, so that's, we have 70,000 cost pool on the base contract, and then there's 50,000 on the uh, cost pool for MAT. So we, we sometimes have to pay, um, in addition to the contract price, we have to pay anything over that cost pool. And we, we've always done that with this provider and the previous provider. Yeah, I, I, I need, we did that as reason. Not got it public, but yeah. did we pay over last year? Yes. Do you have a number? No, sir. Do you have any idea? But again, it's could Medicaid expansion, does it have the potential to reduce this number? The number for the contract? Yes. No. 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 The contract pays for the cost pool, the cost of having a provider, psychiatry services, a counselor, the nurses, um, the hours that were there, the equipment that we use, any medical supplies. The Medicaid would just help with any additional costs. So making sure we don't go over our cost pool for prescriptions. Um, and when we have to send people out for referrals or even hospitalizations. Is there expense in that for Narcan? What do you mean? As you guys have Narcan. Yes, yeah. And we, that's provided. Yeah, we, um, so we carry Narcan in medical. We have um, Narcan distributed throughout the the areas of the jail for use with the officers if they need it, if we can't get to them as soon as possible. Um, and then with Matt, every person that's been initiated in the program has been given one dose of intranasal Narcan to be released with. And I, we, have, we started the program on the 3rd of April, thank you, the 3rd of April, and I have already had a few people who have been successful on it um, who has called me and continued treatment and has not been back to jail or relapsed. In just that one month period of time, I believe I have three people who have been successful that I know about. Three. In, in one month, that's huge. <laughs> that's three people's lives who have been drastically changed by this. And there's, there's many more people in the program. I have numbers for that too. Um, oh Lord. So for April, we started 46 people in the program. And note, a lot of these people may still be with us in the jail. So they don't, haven't had the opportunity to be successful on the outside yet. Um, but I think that's a huge thing that three people have been successful and have reached out, continued treatment. And the responses that we're getting from the people within the jail who have been started in this program, they're like completely different people and they are motivated. They want to go out and help others and not go back to this. Good. Other questions, comments, commissioners? <clears throat> also, if I may add, we are expecting for the jail expansion and remodeling to be complete hopefully this fall. Um, we will be opening um, three, four, four of our additional housing units. So our jail expansion will be complete. So we'll have the capacity to house 422 inmates. Um, I can only imagine that that will also put an additional workload on our medical staff. So if you'll just keep that in consideration as well. Does this contract take into consideration an increase in the population? population? It does not address a population, um, but it does run through the end of the 23-24 fiscal year. So if we hit max 400 and some detainees, we're still under this contract? That is my understanding. Is that right? I can have 
our attorney Scott and review this if you'd like, because I'm not sure, but that was my understanding. It doesn't address, and I don't have the original contract that we signed, but I don't know that it addresses any kind of population Just trying to make sure or try to determine that there's not some surprises out there for us, whatever we do here. There is nothing in this amendment about a population cap or any kind of population limits that they will cover. It's, this is basically totally based, based on number of hours of employees that re, or nurses or assistants Correct. that are be, being needed. So it doesn't matter by that contract. It doesn't matter where you're talking about 300 or 400. Correct. It's just how many people have you got to have here? Mm -hmm. If we come back in the 400 and some and, uh, uh, attendees, um, if they require more than what we're talking about here with our numbers, we would have to come back and say, we need more hours, correct? Which would amend the contract at that point in time. I will say this from, from our experience with Medico, we've had as low as 212 inmates, and we've had up to, what would you say? A max? Yeah. Like at one time? I've seen the census be 312, I think. So they, may, they make it work. You know, they, Nurse Michelle actually comes in on her days off to make sure that these shifts are covered, right. that our inmates are attended to, that all the medical screenings are done, that they are um, contributing to the classification efforts that we make to ensure that our inmates are housed correctly for their medical needs and for the safety of uh, other people. And so we, pay, we have paid the same contract regardless of what our population was. Whether it was 200 or 300 in the past, they've always made sure the job got done. And like right now with our MAP program, we don't have our MAP nurses yet. And so Nurse Michelle and the other nurses that are currently with us are making sure that both of these programs are administered and they're doing that incredibly well. Um, so they will make sure that the job gets done if we have 450 inmates and we have seen that um, in working with Medico staff. It's expensive, uh, but I think the liability on the other side, if we yeah. have something happen uh, that we're not, that we're somehow liable for something that we did, should have done and didn't do. Um, I, if I can add something else, I worked in the jail 20 years ago. I went back down there last year when Major Cheek was out on medical leave the extent of medical care that they have to give in the jail to inmates now, it doesn't even compare to what, we would have never kept some of those people in jail when I worked down there. Um, we have people that are in our facility that have a tracheotomy. Um, we have had people that are actually living with their intestines hanging outside of their body. Um, there are some incredibly difficult medical situations that some of these people have when they come to us. And Medico is able to effectively manage those within our facility. Um, and I'm just, we're very blessed that we have the level of care that we have. And I don't think that we would have been in that same situation four years ago. All right, comments, questions? Well, the, the only thing I'm thinking about here, Mr. Chairman, is the fact that 
Okay, if we've got this contract and it, you're saying that's their numbers, if they're going to live with those numbers, yeah. and if our intake numbers go from 300 to 400, Tough. Yeah, we've we've capped our exposure. Are you saying yeah. that we've capped our exposure? That's a good way of saying it. We've capped ourselves. <clears throat> okay, M Mr. Mr. Attorney, what is their recourse? Do they have any? You mean Medicos? Re recourse? Yeah. Well, I haven't reviewed the contract. I, I, <laughs> I mean, I'd, have, I'd have to look at it. I mean. Um, I'm assuming that there aren't any clauses in there or anything that would allow for clawbacks or, or right. if there's any change. And I'm assuming that also that they're aware of the expansion. I mean, they're there. They see. <laughs> yeah. they're living with they it. see that the jail Every is day. expanding. They're, li they're living with that expansion. So I, I assume that they've baked that into their presentation. So if not, you'll see a big jump. You know, the next time you do this. Yeah. I guess the right word you use is, do they have a clawback? Yeah. All right. What's the pleasure of the board? <clears throat> we have a motion for discuss for any further discussion. I think Medico has provided excellent service. So I'll make a motion to approve the contract for Medico for inmate medical services for fiscal year 23-24 and allow the county manager to sign the contract. Do I have a second? I'll second that. Motion and a second to approve the request. Further discussion on the motion. Those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. No. Motion passes four to one. Thank you. All right, item skipping D, item E, creation of the funding for human services planner position, uh, planner evaluator. Uh, I will say as Tara is coming forward, this would involve the opioid funds. Is that correct, Tara? That's correct. Okay. Good evening, Chairman Fry, Commissioners. Um, thank you all for the opportunity to speak to you all this evening. Um, as the opioid settlement funding work has progressed, it has become very clear that Randolph County could benefit from having a human services planner or evaluator that would provide support for the settlement funds project, including implementation of strategies in compliance with the North Carolina Memorandum of Agreement and the activities approved by this board. The human services planner or evaluator will work closely with the organizations that apply for and receive funding. Examples of the work that this position would do would include engagement with stakeholders to make recommendations on use of the funds, ensure that the funds are used appropriately, complete required impact reports, and provide needed technical assistance to agencies receiving opioid settlement funds. Overall, this position will strengthen the operating processes of agencies receiving funds and is critical to ensuring organizations succeed in the work that they're already doing and that they'll continue to do. So I'm here tonight to request a new position um, the county classification plan currently does not include a position of this type. Um, we'd like to also ask that the human services planner evaluator position be added to the classification plan at a grade 121. And like Chairman Fry mentioned, the funds that would cover this position would be opioid settlement funds. Um, the proposed recruitment salary would be a grade 121, step 12, up to the amount of um, 87, just over $87,000, and that includes um, salary and fringe. The public health department would um, take on the operating costs, like travel, that kind of thing, you know, needed supplies. Um, and then once settlement funds are expended, we would look at the position, evaluate it, and decide whether or not to continue with this position. Um, and I'm happy to answer any questions that y'all may have. 
do you have somebody already to move into this and then you'll hire at a different level or going to hire for this position? We would hire for this position. You all know that right now Jennifer Layton, our assistant director, is spending yes. a lot, has spent and continues to spend a lot of time on opioid settlement she work. She spent a lot of time on Yes. That. And we need an assistant health director. She's good at what she does, but we need an assistant health director. What you're saying is you want her back. <laughs> yes. <laughs> She's great at what she does, um, and she would be a great resource for the individual that would come into this role. It would give her Jennifer the opportunity to get back to assistant health director roles in addition to having the support person under her. She would still continue helping with opioids, opioid settlement, but this this position would focus on opioid-related work solely. Questions of Tara? No, I would just point out for anybody who's listening that this is an approved use of these funds. Thank you, Hope. And like the budget memo, I guess, is for you or Will. I don't know. Is that so? That three hundred is that is that for a three-year period? Is that yes? Yes, that's what we mm -hmm. just ballparked a three-year period. That matches up all the other programs, which were for three years I as mean, well. And the opioid money is for 18, so it can be renewed. Yes. Yeah. So I have, I have a question, just because I'm curious. There are so many, uh, there's so much accountability with the other funds. Um, there's so many strings attached, so much paperwork that has to be done to account for um, you know, so much documentation that has to be turned in. Is that required for a position or what, you know, what do you, what do you have to turn in? Do you get what I'm saying? You know, when we looked at um, using the opioid funds, there was just an overwhelming amount of data that, that any group that gets funding has to complete. They, I mean, and, and so I'm assuming there's something that, you know, that you have to put in for a position or for how this, does that work? For this position? Yes. I don't know that there are any specific. It has to be vetted in the same way, doesn't it? Yeah. Jen, uh, Leo can probably better yeah. answer. Yeah. Yeah. Because this is about reporting. Uh, yeah, I'm asking for rep about reporting because this is you know, this is the opioid settlement funding. I'm going to let Leah take And I've on. seen how much is required from any of the organizations that would get any financial award. And so I just wondered if that's, that sure. if you have to do that as well for a position or what's required. I know I'm not explaining it well. I'm sorry. Well, it's a pass through. You, you explained it very, yes. it very well. So, the, so what the county actually is required to do as a... Um, Part of the MOA funds, signing on or receiving those funds, are four reports each year. It's, it's 90 days of the end of your fiscal year. It includes a status survey, an impact report, a financial report, and then a report on your successes, which should include uh, success stories as well as any issues that you have. The quarterly reporting that you see in your request for proposals process was actually a, a modification of that to, to make sure that the awarded agencies were receiving more monitoring and oversight right, than right, was, right. that was included in the MOA. So depending on how the position will work, they will also work with the agencies to develop those quarterly reports, uh, consolidate those, and then submit those at the end of the year. Okay. Yes. Gotcha. Thank, Thank you. you. All right. Any other questions? What's well, the pleasure of the board? Um, I'll make <coughs> Wait a minute. i got to find it. Okay. Um, I'd like to make a motion to approve the addition of a new position, Human Services Planner Evaluator 2, to the County Classification Plan effective May the 1st, 2023, and approve the associated budget amendment. Second. A motion and a second. Further discussion or questions? Anybody understand the issue? Those in favor will let it be known by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. And it is approved. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tara. Okay, now we have a public hearing on the final. We're getting down to our last fire department. <laughs> Yay! Farmer. <laughs> See Tracy back there. I know he's tired of coming up here. <laughs> okay. 
I know we can hardly believe it's the last one, but um, you know, as you know, our current fire protection, the current fire protection tax district for farmer, like our previous tax districts for the other fire departments in the county, farmer currently has a 15 cent cap on the tax rate. Um, you've removed that cap for all districts except farmer. And at your February meeting, you officially considered moving forward to abolish the current cap county service district for farmer and replacing it with a district that does not have that limitation. Um, the proposed new district contains the exact same properties that are currently contained in the cap district. Um, for the district, you determined that the current cap on taxation has rendered or will render the district obsolete for providing the necessary protection. You also considered the um, population, the population density of the district, the appraised value of property subject to taxation in the district, the present tax rates of the county and any cities or special districts in which the proposed district or any portion is located, the ability of that district to sustain the taxes necessary to provide the services for the district as well. After considering those matters, you passed a resolution declaring your intent to create the proposed district and to abolish the current one and calling for a report to be prepared in accordance with North Carolina general statutes. The, resolu the resolution also set the public hearing for the April meeting, but that hearing was later rescheduled also by resolution for tonight. Um, notice of the public hearing was mailed and published in accordance with statutory requirements. So at this meeting, you need to hold a public hearing on the abolishment of the current district and the creation of the new district for the farmer area. And at the close of the hearing, if you find that the current district is insufficient to provide the required protection and that there is a demonstrable need for providing fire protection services in the proposed district, that it is impossible or impracticable to provide fire protection services on a countywide basis, that it is economically feasible to, f to provide fire protection services in the proposed district without unreasonable or burdensome annual tax levies, and that there is a demonstrable demand for fire protection services, then you may pass the resolution in your packet which abolishes the current district and creates the new uncapped district. And if you make that change, it will go into effect July 1 of this year. So. All right, any questions of Amy? Does that include or exclude properties on old 49? It's the same properties that are currently in the district. I, I think, cannot answer that I question, think, but I assure I you there are people question. here who can. So. <laughs> yeah, I think that was a trick question. Yeah, a trick question. Oh, yeah. All right. We will open the public hearing. Is there anyone here tonight who wishes to speak concerning the change in the structure of Farmer Fire District? Yes, ma'am. Uh, this is comment is toward the gentleman that brought up about gun violence. I hope that you will do all you can to support um, less accessibility to guns. You can't make a mentally ill person take their medicine. And I just hope you'll support the lack of, I mean, we just, they, well, but we need to are, have some kind of. Are you here to speak to the farmer fire tax? District? Oh, no, I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> That's what we're doing right now. I can't hear well anyway, and I, I'm, I'm sorry. sorry. Yes. I appreciate All right. yeah. uh, I appreciate the respect you've shown each of us, and thank you. Thank you. Anyone here tonight concerning, you want to come forward? Give us, give us your name and address. My name is Paul Lambert, and I live on 49. And I understand that everything in today's economy is more expensive. So to, for them to have the ability to raise the tax, I can understand. But what it sounds like we're doing right now is we now have a cap tax. We're just going to open it up and give them a, a open checkbook. They no. can write the zeros in. No, first of all, they don't have taxing authority. 
well, that, who, whoever. That comes to this board just like it has been done right. for all, all these years. Right. Each so, department comes before this board has the taxing authority, not the, not the farm, farm or fire department. Yeah, I'm not talking about the fire department. I'm talking about y'all or whoever. Mm -hmm. My thought would be, okay, set another cap that's reasonable so I know what, what my responsibilities are going to be in the yeah. future. Yeah. And then if, if in the future it needs, then we can vote again. But I would like to see them, you know, set some, well, uh, case in point, we just got a tax in pop, property tax increase, insurance increase. My escrow on my mortgage fell $750 short because of that. Now I got to come up with that all of a sudden. And this would be the same thing. Y'all raise the taxes and without me knowing about it, you know, I'm responsible for that on the spot. It will not be done without you knowing about it. I'm sorry? It would not be done without you knowing about it. That well, would, yeah, that would, I know that. That would be another public hearing just like we're having right now for any citizen to come and speak to that issue. And then we would have a say in whether it gets done or not. You, you would have a say. You, would have, you can participate in that process. Yes, sir. Well, as long, I mean, every meeting I've ever been a part of so far, it's like it's a public meeting, but what y'all say doesn't matter. We're going to do what we want to do anyhow. That's and not, that's I know that's not, not that's you guys. That's not always the case. Yeah, I that mean. was the, the whole expansion no. of 49 and that whole, that whole deal. So, mm -hmm. But that, that's my concern. I just want to know that I, as a property owner out there, will have the say, or at least some say, in that process. Yes. That has to be and like I say, I understand, you know, it, it costs me more to live today. Yes. They have to, they yeah. have to do something, but I don't want to write them a, a and, blank and check either. Without the fire department, then yeah, they have yeah. OSHA requirements, insurance requirements. Yep. Yeah. Your homeowners would go way up. <clears throat> right. Right. Like I say, I understand, you know, but, yes. but I did want to voice my opinion about that right. because. Thank you. Yeah, personally, I'm retired now. I'm on Social Security. My income doesn't go up, so I have to count for everything. And surprises are not fun, especially when they're financial surprises. Right. <clears throat> yes. So that's all I got to say. Point out Thank, you. Thank you. Please sign in, sir. Are you going to point Please out? Please come forward. Yet. They need you yeah. Thank you. And, and there's a total cap <clears throat> on that with yeah. this new yeah. Thank piece. You very much. Yes. And sir, there there is a there is a total cap. That includes any other local taxes that you would pay, and uh, that that's that there is a cap. And can there's I, a can I speak to his suggestion just just to make it clear that I know that he suggested that we you know pick an, another cap. That's not an option that's available to us. Um, under the general statutes, it's either the 15 cent cap or it's the overall cap. We don't have the option of setting and an Can you give us that overall cap, if you don't mind? What, the, with total the overall Avalorum cap now, it's everything. Yeah. It's yeah. when you take Avalorum, your current property school tax fire. rates, school tax rates, city tax rates, fire, everything cannot exceed $1.50 per $100 valuation. Right, yeah. but there's there's not an option for us to go from a 15 cent cap to a 20 cent cap or to set our own cap. That's not an option available to us under the general statutes. And the the current fire tax rates have not been set for next year either. There will be a public hearing in June to consider fire tax the fire tax request to this board. That, that will be a matter of public uh, announcement also. Anyone else here tonight who wishes to speak to the Farmer Fire District? Tracy, come on up. Tracy Bowles. So I'm Tracy Bowles. I'm the Chief of Farmer Fire Department. Um, Former fire department has been very diligent with taxpayers' money. In 1987, when the fire tax was established at former fire department, which I've been there almost 30 years now. Mr. Boyles, if, you, if you'll just... Okay. Yeah. Okay, I'm address, sorry. Address us. But uh, when it was established in 1987, it was set at 8 cents. 
Farmer Fire Department stayed at eight cents for about six years. Then, on behalf of the board, they dropped their fire tax to seven cents. <laughs> then, we went up to eight cents after about eight years. We dropped it again back to seven cents. Then we came back and went to seven and a half cents. We stayed at seven and a half cents for 16 years while the other fire departments in the county went up. And then finally, we went to nine cents and we stayed there for seven years. Till last year, we went to 12 cents. We were one of the fourth lowest fire taxes in the county for almost 25 years. When we went to 12 cents, that was the average. Three quarters of the fire departments in Randolph County was at 15 cents then. And we still were diligent. Why are we the last ones to ask for this? David was there that night. Maxton was there that night in the meeting. I said, I'm going to be last because I'm a taxpayer in former fire departments district too. I said, y'all raise it above this. You think I'm going to go ask nine cent to go to 15 or 16 cent? No, that'd take an idiot to do that. So we're diligent on our tax, taxes. I pay taxes. I got family members pay. Maxton pays fire department tax and pharma. And you know, we've been very diligent. And I just want people to know that. We just don't come and ask for a blank check. And we have done great there with one department. We're a class four DOI rate with no hydrants for anything. With one paid person, five part-time guys. You don't have people beating down your doors to be volunteers these days. You have to go out and find them. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, sir. You. Thank Tracy. Anyone else here wants to speak to the Farmer Fire District issue? Hearing none, then we will close the public hearing and we'll come back for a motion on agenda item F. Mr. Chairman, I want to make the motion to approve the resolution abolishing the Current 15 cent cap farmer fire protection county service district and creating a new service district without the cap. Do I have a second? Second. Any other discussion on the motion? Hearing none, those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. 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 Opposed, no. And it passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay, item uh, G. Funding for the uh, on-site medical clinic. Sam Barner. <clears throat> Mr. Chair, Board of County Commissioners, good evening. The first few words of our mission statement for our employee wellness program start out, because our employees are our most valuable resource. We value our employees' health and well-being. With that said, I'm requesting that you authorize the uh, completion of an on-site medical clinic for employees and their dependents. What is an on-site medical clinic? An employer on-site medical clinic is a primary care facility that provides acute medical services at no cost to the employees and their dependents. There are many advantages to having an on-site medical clinic. Number one, and probably the most important, having an on-site medical clinic for employees and their dependents reduce health care costs and will save the county money. It will also improve employee productivity. One of the things we've been focused on for the last several years is employee retention and recruitment. Having an on-site medical clinic will definitely improve retention of our current employees. It will also improve access to quality medical care, especially for our at-risk employees. And lastly, but certainly not least, 
it will reduce the annual biometric screening cost. Last year, 70% of our employees who went through the biometric screenings used their own primary care provider. The average cost back to the employee, to our, to our employer through healthcare, or actually through insurance costs, was an average of $172 per employee, per visit. Having an on-site medical clinic will reduce that cost to just under $80 at $79 per visit. So again, we'll save a lot of money on just biometric screenings. Having this on-site medical clinic, we plan to offer some specialty services. Number one, we want to offer and we will offer a medical advocacy program. This is a game changer for our employees. This program will allow the staff to act as medical advocates for our, their employees and their families in this very convoluted current medical care system. Number two, we will offer a medical concierge service where if an employee or their dependent needs specialty care or advanced care, the clinic staff will make the contact to the specialist and they will see that specialist within 48 hours. That is another game changer for our employees. Number three, it will improve our preventive screenings for our employees because the staff there will expedite the screening services. Currently and sadly, about 40% of our employees do not get their standard health screenings which could potentially cost us a lot of money. So this will improve that service. Also, this clinic will have an on-site pharmacy, making it very convenient when an employee or their family members visit the clinic, they can pick up their medications there without having to make an extra trip. We currently have multiple vendors that do our occupational medicine and health services for our employees. This will eliminate that. We will have the occupational health program fall under this clinic. What does occupational health do? It does pre-employment screenings, random drug tests, workers' compensation, and occupational therapy. That will be all under the same roof here. And another service is that we will have in this clinic is something unique. We will create a weight loss program so one of the biggest drivers of our health care costs today. In this program, we will offer weight loss medication at a reduced rate through grant funding and coupons. That will save us a lot of money. We'll also have a registered dietitian on site to counsel our employees who are going through this program. After months of uh, research, we had a special uh, committee come together we interviewed five vendors and we selected uh, Wake Forest or Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist to be the vendor to run this clinic. We are confident they will do an outstanding job. The projected cost for this clinic is $405,000 annually with a startup cost of $50,000. There will be some capital improvements needed to put this building together we anticipate that renovation costs can be absorbed by the Northgate Renovation Fund. All in all, the research from four independent studies state that for every dollar we invest in an on-site medical clinic, we will save $3 on health care savings. So this will be a great investment for our employees and their families. And to talk about the capital investment and the plan and layout, Paxton is going to come up. Thank you. When Sam told me this was coming up on the agenda, he said that there was some interest in possibly located at Northgate. So we looked at you know, the space that was remaining up there, and, and the problem is, you know, it's about full. You, if you look in your handout, you should have a map there of of the Northgate area and you can see that there's no more vacant space available. So really the only option was in our business continuity space. So we don't want to lose the business continuity. However, 
there was an area sort of to the north and front of the building that's not in the core of the business continuity area that was a possibility. So Sam and I met the uh, Wake representatives there to look at that space and they said it would work out really well for them. And so we hired Smith Senate Architects to help put together a preliminary floor plan. And um, they, they met with the Wake staff and found out what their programming needs were. We then, they didn't put together a couple options and uh, they, they looked it over and they came up with um, option two, which you should have there in your packet. Just going through that floor plan, you can see we'd be cutting in a new door at the front. This is right next to child support. Inside that door, there would be a new a lobby and a reception and a secure doorway to the hallway. From there, there would be a nurse's station with some storage and a pharmacy area. We then have a, a client restroom and then a, a lab with a drug testing restroom and then five uh, exam rooms and overflow space and a couple offices. Um, once again, the, the Staff looked at these drawings and said this would work out really well. They have just a few comments about them, but it, it, this would work out and give them room for future. This actually has an additional exam room. It's a, a little larger than the space we first looked at, but it has room for growth. Um, Smith Senate also put together a preliminary cost estimate for us, and uh, most of the upfront, uh, like furniture and the technology, is coming from Wake so we don't have to include that in our budget. It's mainly just the architect's fee and construction costs. And those two combined comes in at roughly 300,000. We've talked to Will and we have approximately 300,000 remaining in the Northgate fund. So we would not take any additional county funds. So with, with that, I'll be glad to answer any questions. And Questions? No, I have a couple for Sam, if that's okay. Yes, ma'am. Sure. Um, so, if I understand correctly from being in on some of these conversations, an employee, if they uh, want some kind of spe or need specialist, or if they have a doctor that they're already working with, they'll be able to continue to use that person just because this is the provider doesn't mean they will track people into their system, correct? That is correct. They provide agnostic service, which means they cannot and will not force people in their system. They will give our employees a choice. They will provide them choices that are with them or agnostic as well. So yes, you are correct. Okay, and I would like to point out um, Seeing the specialist within 48 hours, from, I think that is huge. If, if people understood the nature of health care, um, it's my understanding that with one of our employees, they saw a doctor about an issue and the doctor was going to schedule them for further testing and it was going to be about three weeks before they could get in and they died two weeks later. This so I'd like to think I mean, this is huge. I call a specialist trying to get in, and it takes me two and a half months. So going through the clinic, some of our, our employees and their dependents being, um, you know, getting services within 48 hours, I, I think that's huge. My only regret is I wish I'd push for this sooner because um, I know many situations where employees have had situations arise where they didn't get the service in time. You're referring to an employee that passed away recently. He complained of chest pains. He went to his PCP. They did a test on him. It came back okay, negative. But he was referred to a cardiologist. The cardiologist's appointment was three weeks away. This person passed away two weeks before that appointment. Had he seen his cardiologist, his life might have been saved. Hopefully this advocacy program can save lives because we owe it to our employees to give them the best, most rapid service possible. Thank you. What, are your, what would be the hours of operations? 
It'll be a 40 hour week and we will determine that based on feedback we get from our departments, especially our, our 24 hour first responders. We'll have to accommodate for them as well. What, uh, what would be the time frame for getting this established? I know, I know you're gonna have to, when would you open? It, it depends on construction costs. That, that's the only, I, I just our goal is to have it ready by the end of September for this season's biometric screenings, which will save us a lot of money. Other questions? If there's no further, uh, well, I guess this, I guess, and this is not necessarily a question. It's just uh, just what I'm thinking. I guess it could be during, you know, after we make a motion or whatever. But uh, and looking at this, you know, proposal, and we had talked about it some. I mean, I think it's definitely a benefit. And then, you know, on the cost saving side from the county, I mean, that's the big thing for me. It just you know is a cost savings and you've proven that in several different ways so that you know, the only concern I had which is not a criticism is just something that you know is the part where you know the county stepping in and taking business away from some of our local doctors and healthcare providers and that concerns me but I guess at the end of the day you know if we're saving the county as a whole dollars because we see insurance just going up and up and up and all those visits and everything and i know what the county plan looks right. like and one of those bills come back to the county and we have to pay through our insurance provider and those numbers go up i think ultimately it's a saving for the taxpayers in randolph county uh as well as being a benefit for our employees but it was just what went through my head is yes. you know how do our local providers feel right and then the part point that you know commissioner haywood made you know we're still you know you're able to use your own Healthcare provider, you know, if you need to go out for other services and there's something you're not doing at clinics, so that's good. But if you like your primary provider, you can still use it. I hate to coin that that no. that phrase, but that is correct. Yes, it will save us money, and yes, we will work with our vendors. We've already talked to them about case scenarios about if they like their vendor, that they will work with that vendor to get the right results. At the end of the day, we are obligated to providing the best service for our employees, and at the same time, saving taxpayers money. So I want to act just curious, and you may not know, and if you don't, that's okay. You can tell me some other time because I want to know regardless. You mentioned that biometric screening done, you know, through, like, you know, somebody else's doctor somewhere is, is about $172. Mm -hmm. All right, and this will make it under $80. Yes. But currently, with the $172, how much... What's the reimbursable on that by the insurance company? Most of it. They, that's why the cost is so much. When you go through the insurance, you have added fees on there, and then you have higher reimbursables for the, for the uh, primary care provider. And so at the end of the day, that's what we pay on the bottom line, on average. Okay. You know, when we have our fixed costs for our clinic, we, we bypass those ex, extra costs, and we have a fixed cost, so we know what those costs are. So it's $80. Yep. That is correct. That's based on two surveys. That's, out, that's also confirmed by the city of Asheboro. Who's, that's less than half. And yes. Asheboro does this now. That is, that is correct. I was supposed to have a physical at 9 o'clock this morning. I got a phone call last week telling me that he would not be able to see me. I should call to make another appointment. I made this appointment in January. <clears throat> yeah. I... Sorry you experienced that. I've heard many numerous stories from our employees. It's heartbreaking, and I don't have the time to share you, but this, I can guarantee you, will help our employees in their health and well-being. Any other questions? Other questions? Any? Okay. If there are no further questions, I'm requesting uh, the Board of County Commissioners to award the contract to Atrium Health Wake Forest Baptist for medical clinic services in the amount of $405,000 and authorize the county manager to sign the contract. Furthermore, I'm asking that you authorize the county, uh, the county manager to contract with Smith Senate Architects for the design of the wellness clinic. Since he has read the motion, anybody want to make a motion? I'll make it. I'll second it. I have a motion and a second. Any other discussion or questions? Hearing none, those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Those no, and it, it's approved unanimously. Thank Thanks, you. Sam. Thank you, Sam. work. Thank you, Sam. Okay. Um, item H. 
Who's going to do this? RJ's not here. Yeah. Uh, RJ Williams, our IT director, uh, has prepared a, a, a good uh, summary of, of what this situation is. His son was having his last baseball game, high school baseball game tonight, and the chairman and I told him to go to that baseball game and that the two of us would handle this. <laughs> Basically, what this is, is is updating, keeping updated the county's Microsoft computer systems involving not only our email system, but our security system uh, that we have, which is a good one now. The, the systems that we're having are going to be expiring in October, and this allows the county a continuity of our services uh, with Microsoft that, that we currently have. How well, ironic. David, don't you ask me any detailed <laughs> questions, because I know There's you some are. irony here. So I'll, how I'm how ironic that. is it that tonight, when we have this on the agenda, our system died? The system died. <laughs> our old system won't work anymore. So, um, and really, that's, that's not fun. That, that's the way it is. And I think this also, with all the hacking and that's going on today, it's a... Uh, it's a protection for us and our employees and the citizens of the county too. There's a lot of, a lot of records are kept in this county. A lot of personal records are in our system here at the county. I, th I think it also probably uh, makes it easier to administer patches and fixes to all the, uh, the, the uh, various computers and whatnot as opposed to having to physically touch yes. each and every one. You just yes. Microsoft automatically has those uh, updates. Um, and that's a, that's a big help to the IT staff, I'm sure. Yes, it is. If you'll notice um, in, <clears throat> in the attachment, it gives a total cost of $888,600. Part of that was already approved in our current budget for 22-23. So to carry it up, to, to get the, the most recent, the most up-to-date system, we would need, not the 888, we would need a, an additional $268,000. So, uh, was that about 620000 of that was already budgeted, had, had been set aside in our current budget. So, that's where we are, and um, that is the request. As I said, I don't know about the timeline for doing all this. How do it, it would begin now. Yes. As soon as possible. Yeah. There's some stuff sunset. Right there. Right. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, you were looking for a motion? Yes, sir. I'll uh, make a motion to uh, approve the new rule of the Microsoft's 365 contract at the enterprise level and an additional $268,000. And two, allow the county manager to sign the contract. And three, to approve the associated budget amendment. I have a second. Second. I have a second by Maxton. Any other discussion or questions? Those in favor will say aye. 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 Those no, and it is approved unanimously. Next item uh, is our um, one North Carolina grant. Will. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As you recall, back in February, we had an economic development uh, public hearing with Archdale, or what they call Project Superman, which ends up being uh, Axiom Packaging. Axiom went and got a, uh, or applied for a one North Carolina grant, uh, which they were awarded 365,000, which passes through the counties. So this is just a request for the uh, board to accept that and the budget amendment to show that passing through. And we've already met our match. The match is already uh, included. Our incentive is the match. So this is just to receive the $365,000 one NC grant uh, from the state. I have a motion. I'll make that motion. Mr. Do you have a second? Second. Any other discussion or questions? Those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Those no. And it's approved. Next is the historic courthouse renovation. Paxton. Thank you. When I was here last month, I, I told you that our architect was working with the low bidder to try to negotiate a reduced scale project that mainly consisted of just the elevator addition. And I was hoping to come here tonight and be able to present that, that proposal. Um, 
Uh, actually, our architects had um, offered to come here tonight to present it, but the, the price that they received from the contractor was two and a half million dollars just for the elevator addition. And I, I told the architect there was really no way I could recommend that you accept that. That, that just seemed so high. Uh, so uh, I told him not to worry about coming tonight. And um, we're going to look, I'm recommending that we put this out for bid a second time with just the elevator addition and just a, a couple um, alternates for the life safety type thing, like the step at the front door and the handrails and probably the, the mechanical unit in the attic. Uh, things that really need to be done, but, but otherwise just the elevator addition. And um, luckily the architects have uh, agreed they would they rebid it. Uh, the design's already there, so it's just a mag matter of repackaging it. And they said they'll do that at no additional cost. There's enough savings in the construction administration now that the project's you know getting smaller that they can absorb that. And uh, you know, with your blessing, we'll go ahead and and go in that direction. What about the HVAC? Wasn't that in question? Well, the HVAC was two parts. One part was the mechanical unit up in the attic in the balcony. You know, it's a 1960s model unit. Uh, we've definitely got our money out of it, but we're on borrowed time. And so I would recommend that we keep that as an alternate to go ahead and get it priced. Um, we also had, you know, some mechanical costs for for heating the downstairs as part of the museum. Um, but, you know, it depends on you if you want to include that or not. That is not one of the high priorities. Okay. That's good. All right. We have a motion to authorize Paxton to proceed for rebidding the, pro the courthouse project. Well, since we can't keep meeting here, if we don't make it ADA compliant, then I will make a motion that we approve dropping the pre-qualification requirement and rebidding the historic courthouse project with a much smaller request. Second. I have a motion and a second. Uh, further questions and comments? Those in favor, let it be known by saying aye. Aye. Opposed, no, and it is approved. Uh, Thank you. Fingers crossed. Next is for Thank the qualification for bids on the uh, sewer system, sewer work. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, for the past year, we've, we've talked about growth in eastern Randolph County, and, and, you know, we got our master plan, which had a whole list of potential projects, and one of those projects is the water line on Highway 64 from Ashburg to the Wolf Speed campsite, and it's my understanding that Ashburg City, later this month, plans to select an engineer to start that design process. And so I, I, I would recommend that we also start the process of issuing a request for qualifications to select an engineer for some of our projects so that we can stay in line with Ashburg. Because the problem is if, you know, as soon as Ashburg gets the green light to start designing that, that line, if, if we haven't told them how much of Randolph County's uh, water that we want to flow through it, then they'll size it for, for wolf speed only, and we will have sort of missed our opportunity to, to be included in that. So I think um, one of the first projects we will look at is the uh, water line from the Piedmont Triad Water Authority to Ashboro, so that at least we could sell our uh, current allocation. Do you have any idea what the timeline would be on that? I, I, I don't. I think we could get started on the, the water line design you know, pretty quickly. There's uh, also some um, maintenance projects from you know, Franklinville and Ramsar that we could get started on. Uh, a lot of the others, we're going to have to make some decisions about and figure out the wastewater treatment plant issue before we can, before we can take on a lot of some of those other projects. All right, do I have a motion then for Paxton to proceed? I'd make that mo I'll make that motion, Mr. Chairman, if you want me to, to approve the RFQ for engineering firms, provide professional services for projects identified in Randolph County's water and sewer master plan. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and second. Those in favor? Discussion, any other discussion? Those in favor will say aye. Aye. Those no, and it's approved. And that, 
is our last agenda item, folks. Thank you. We will, uh, I'm working with William Johnson on that, and we'll go ahead and get started on that process and, and hopefully get a committee to review the applicants. Thank you. I don't. Um, let me just say to everyone here that has stayed tonight with us and those that might still be with Mr. us. Chairman, oh, one sorry. quick thing. Yes. Uh, May the 11th, uh, district meeting for the yes. uh, North Carolina Association of County Commissioners uh, at the Emergency Operations Center. It starts at 5 o'clock. Uh, so if you could look at your calendars and love to have you there. We've got trying to get some of our uh, legislators from about 12 county area, which would include District 9 and 11, uh, which is basically run from uh, Wake County over to Guilford County and down south toward uh, Lee and Moore, so, uh, and up toward the North Carolina uh, Virginia border. So. We'll, we'll, we will be the host county, so um, that's good. Any other comments? We've had a lot to discuss tonight. I think it's important that we took time to discuss these issues. We thank all of you for your patience. And with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? I move. Do I have a second? Second. We are adjourned. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> <laughs>